So I'm John, brother of <coughs> Jose. Originally grew up in Philadelphia, so I'm not French, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And so his reason for coming to France, I think that's very significant for us, that there were kind of a double reason. No? The first reason, the most, more immediate reason was the war, and be, wanting to be with the victims of, of violence and so on and do what he could, just to be there and see what he could. But the second reason was he was thinking of a community and maybe to find a place which could be a kind of community based on prayer and so on. In the rule of Thézé, the original rule, there's an expression uh, living a parable of community, a parable of community. Why did he say parable of community? Because he didn't want to say model or kind of something to be imitated. Jesus told stories, and these stories were helping people to grasp the gospel message. But you don't take the story literally, it's a sign. And so I think in the same way he felt a community like ours could be a sign that would help people to deepen their understanding of the gospel. And maybe every religious community could be that, and they all have different shapes and forms, but they're all trying to, to communicate that, that essential of the message of Jesus. So, Brother Roger never liked the, the division into active and contemplative. He sort of felt that every Christian is, should be a person of prayer and should also be somehow serving brothers and sisters. So the idea of this division, he didn't want it. But I, I suppose what monastic means we don't define ourselves by any particular work. We define ourselves, I guess, as a community that tries to live a sign of reconciliation among ourselves, a sign of the gospel, and pray together. And then the, the other aspect is the hospitality, and that's the thing that's changed the most. Mm -hmm. um, in the early years, it was a few people, pastors and so on, who came for retreats and so on. After the war, the community raised some orphans. They worked with some prisoners of war, but, and then people came for silent retreats. And then in the 1960s, it kind of exploded. Uh, young people started coming, and it was a little bit um, unclear. Brother Roger, I think, on the one hand, felt this was really important from the beginning. These, these people are coming, they're searching for something. We need to share, we need to somehow, somehow bring them into an experience of community and prayer. At the same time, we are a monastic community. They wondered a little bit. They started out by keeping the young people a little bit further away. They're a village of about three kilometers away, but that didn't. That wasn't very realistic. So it took on a life of its own, these, these meetings. So now, probably in the course of a year, we have about, oh, I'd say over 100,000 people come through to say There's a lot of bonding and, and discussing the cross boundaries and so on. They share the prayer, so that's why you know the famous music of Teze didn't exist when I first got there. But the other thing was in French; it was very beautiful liturgy, but you know, adapted monastic liturgy, the Psalms, and you know. But uh, as the young people started coming from different countries, we wanted to make it more accessible, and we tried different things. And finally, um, um, you know, this idea of uh, these refrains that sung over and over kind of caught on, and so uh, they became known as the music of Teze. So. That original impulse of Brother Roger coming to Teze um, was also as it was to live a contemplative life, but also to be present in the problems of the time. That's why he came to France. And so when the when things got easier in France, he sent some brothers out into different houses around the world: Brazil, Bangladesh, Nairobi, Senegal, and South Korea. In Bangladesh, for example, one of the things the brothers when they sort of got there after a while, they noticed one, one thing they thought they could do something was about disabled people, people with a handicap or disability. Because in a country like Bangladesh, traditionally, there, people consider that a kind of something shameful, and it's a kind of maybe a curse from God or something, you know, to have a child like that, and they kind of, kind of you know, hide them away and so on. And, and, and the brothers started, you know, working with that, and they ended up creating a, a kind of support group of mothers mainly, parents, but mostly their own mothers. And, um, you know, to talk to one another and share their problems and so on. And it turned out that these mothers were Christian, Muslim, and Hindu, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but they weren't, they didn't come to talk about ecumenical theology, you know. <laughs> they came to talk about their children and being handicapped and the problems and most. But of course they, they felt very close because they're dealing with a very similar situation. So this became... You know, this became an interesting work. So it's the kind of thing I think that yeah. maybe it's another way of doing interreligious work. You know, you're not focusing on the, the differences. You know, even just to have a common language is sometimes difficult. But if you're talking about something very concrete, like your child or something, then you can mm -hmm. yeah. go forward together. Brother Roger uh, was killed in Teze in the church during evening prayer by a de demented woman um, in 2005. It's a very mysterious thing. A woman who 
still today denies that she did it, so it's, it's, it's you know, very strange. And her transition was surprisingly easy, I, even in a personal way. When I lived for 30 years with Brother Roger, and I thought, I was kind of expecting some sort of grief, you know, but it didn't happen. I think that he had given so much of his life to the community, it's as if on some level he never left, in a way. I mean, 